Steven Spielberg's E.T. gave us some of the most iconic moments in film history, with Elliot in E.T.'s first flight becoming Amblin's logo. But in this clip we just saw, we actually edited something out. Did you catch it? Yep, it's a close-up of a shotgun, which was also removed by Steven Spielberg for the 2002 20th anniversary release, which also turned the guns into walkie-talkies. But then Steven Spielberg changed it back in 2011, because with the process of this film, Spielberg learned the same lesson that Elliot learns, the power of letting go. I'm Eric Boss. And this is The Deep Dive, a channel that dives deep into the films we love to reveal new details about them to make us love them on a deeper level. And I didn't think it was possible to love E.T. even more, but I realized something new about E.T. during these dog days of Spielberg summer. It's not a summer movie. It's a Halloween movie. But its themes lead us to associate it with summertime, the kind of summer trouble we get into, and the kind of summer friends we make. So let's dive in. The film opens on black with the title E.T. The Extraterrestrial. E.T. is drawn in purple crayon on text, because remember, E.T. is just these kids' given nickname for it. We never learn its native name or species during the movie, and really, the word alien is never spoken in the film. But E.T.'s species was later established to be canon in the Star Wars universe, with a cameo in Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, in the Galactic Senate. And like everything in Star Wars, they were given a name, Brodo Asogians. Brodo Asogi is their home planet, and is meant to translate to Green Planet, to tie in with the E.T. sequel novel, E.T. The Book of the Green Planet. And according to the first film's novelization, E.T. is over 10 million years old, and in a never-made sequel script, he would be named Zrek. But for this analysis, we will refer to him only as E.T., because all this other stuff was added later, and we will mostly be looking at this story through the eyes of its creators, director Steven Spielberg and screenwriter Melissa Matheson, when they created this amazing film in the early 1980s. So we see a starry night sky with John Williams' timeless theme on flute. Now, E.T. was Spielberg's follow-up to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He actually shot Raiders of the Lost Ark in between, and Close Encounters was his attempt to reconcile the mysteries of the night sky using light and music, which he later realized was his desire to reconnect his music-loving mother with his technology-obsessed father. E.T. is really all about a family separated from each other, and a lonely child who misses his father. That loneliness and homesickness is what connects E.T. and Elliot, Elliot whose full name was revealed in 2015 as Elliot Taylor, initials E. T. Star Wars concept artist Ralph McQuarrie designed E.T.'s spaceship using descriptions in the screenplay for it to look Dr. Seussian, and he made it look Victorian and steampunk, inspired by the work of Jules Verne. And the effect is to make these creatures look peaceful and intellectual, because really they're just a group of botanists collecting plants and fungi from other worlds. This docile quality courses through the design of E.T.'s anatomy, brought to life by Carlo Rambaldi, who had also designed the aliens for Close Encounters. Rambaldi gave them long necks based on his painting Women of Delta, and designed E.T face based on Albert Einstein, the poet Carl Sandburg, the writer Ernest Hemingway, and a pug dog. Staffers from the Jules Stein Eye Institute were consulted to give E.T. huge, expression-filled eyes, which would go on to inspire character designs like Pixar's WALL-E, as eyes are truly are the windows to the soul. E.T. was moved by a team of puppeteers, including two little people, Tamara de Tro and Pat Bailon, along with 12-year-old Matthew Demerit, who was born without legs and would walk on his hands in the costume for the scenes where E.T. would have to walk awkwardly and bump into stuff. E.T.'s hands specifically might be the most important part of his design, because they were moved by a professional mime named Caprice Roth, and these fingers are equally contributing to E.T.'s overall innocence, as we see here when two fingers pull a branch downward. An owl hoots, and all these creatures go on alert. <laughs> before realizing there's no danger. We see how this species shares an empathic link, a life force that we only experience in this film through a child's eyes. But it's really Spielberg's version of George Lucas's The Force in Star Wars. And since Brodo Asogians are Star Wars canon, hell, maybe it actually is The Force, but I don't like to think of it that way. While most of this film was shot in the suburbs of Southern California, these forest scenes were shot in the redwoods of Northern California. And having lived in both regions over the past 13 years, I can tell you there is a kind of magic in California that just makes it feel like eternal summer. It can also make people crazy and attract serial killers, but uh, we'll save that for the Zodiac deep dive. Some trucks roll up and we see oppressive headlights and a polluting exhaust pipe. Spielberg shot most of this film with the camera just three or four feet off the ground from the height of E.T. and the height of a child. And so for most of the film, we do not see these adults' faces, just their flashlights and their jingling keys. This main government agent is only ever referred to in the script as keys. Really, the most tragic part of E.T.'s separation from the others in his group is that he wandered off because he was too busy 
busy staring at the human neighborhood in the valley below. He was lured by curiosity and the promise of human friendship. Spielberg and Matheson developed the story for E.T. from a darker project Spielberg planned called Night Skies, in which malevolent aliens would terrorize a family, but one friendly alien named Buddy befriends an autistic child. That project's final scene would have had Buddy left behind on Earth, and that is where this movie begins. Elliot watches his brother Michael and his friends Greg, Tyler, and Steve play Dungeons and Dragons. I'm ready to play now, you guys! We're in the middle, Elliot. Can't you join any universe in the middle? Yeah, Spielberg loves to have characters over talk, and Greg tells Elliot that he can't join any universe in the middle, painting Elliot as an outcast from this universe, as E.T. is. Whenever I watch this, I love them making Elliot wait for a pizza at the end of the driveway. That's something my siblings and I would do to avoid alerting our parents that we ordered a pizza. And notice as Elliot receives the pizza, their dog Harvey barks like crazy. <laughs> Later, notice how the dog goes quiet and Elliot tosses his ball into the shed. E.T. throws the ball back, already trying to play a game. Michael looks at the tracks. Coyotes come back again, Mom. Ah, Peter Coyote is the name of the actor who plays Keys, and yeah, he's coming. After bedtime, Elliot returns to the corn stalks and finds E.T.'s tracks and literally steps in the footsteps of Christ to find him. <laughs> Already their emotions are linked. Both E.T.'s, Elliot Taylor and E.T., are as scared as the other one is. The next day, Elliot goes out looking for E.T., scattering Reese's pieces. So originally, Steven Spielberg wanted to use M&Ms, but the Mars company refused because they thought E.T. was too ugly and would frighten kids. But as a result of this, Reese's pieces sales exploded, as did product placement in movies in general. E.T. surpassed Star Wars as the most profitable film of all time, beaten only by Spielberg himself with Jurassic Park. And while other movies have surpassed those, E.T. still has the record for the longest unbroken theatrical run. It debuted in theaters in June 1982, and it stayed in theaters for over a year. For many Gen Xers and older millennials and their younger siblings, E.T. was the movie of our childhoods. So the Taylor family, including Gertie, played by a young Drew Barrymore, all speculate what Elliot actually saw. Maybe it was a pervert or deformed kid or something. A deformed kid. It was nothing like that, penis breath! Elliot! Yeah, that laugh from Dee Wallace was spontaneous because, yeah, this would be hilarious to hear a kid say. Then things get really sad when Elliot says, Dad would believe me. Maybe you ought to call your father and tell him about it. I can't. He's in Mexico with Sally. Yeah, this is a family in pain from the father leaving them. Spielberg actually conceived it as a story of himself missing his own father, which he detailed in the HBO documentary. The overriding theme was going to be about how do you fill the heart of a lonely child? And what extraordinary event would it take to fill Elliot's heart after losing his dad? So as a younger man, Spielberg grew distant from his father, Arnold Spielberg, after his parents divorced, not knowing that his mother, Leah, fell in love with the family friend, Bernie Adler. Arnold never told the kids the real reason for the divorce, so Stephen had blamed him for years and years, and he didn't learn the truth until years later when he was an adult. That explains why so many early Spielberg films are trying to work through these daddy issues. I know I brought it up a ton during Spielberg summer, but yeah, Watch The Fablemans. It's a fascinating story, specifically for the way director Spielberg reframes and re-edits his childhood narratives to help himself as an adult heal. It's kind of bizarre that this movie even happened. So E.T. returns to Elliot in the backyard. Part of the charm of E.T. is the sound design. E.T. is voiced by Pat Welsh, a voiceover actress who smoked a ton of cigarettes to get her voice raspy enough, but also they included the sound of a cat purring to make E.T. sound even more affectionate. Elliot leads E.T. through the house with a trail of Reese's Pieces, and Caprice's mime work with the hands just goes such a long way to make E.T. feel timid and sweet and curious, like you would not get this with CGI hands, which is why pre-digital Spielberg touches our hearts more than digital Spielberg does. Like the BFG is a sweet movie that was also written by Melissa Matheson, and really just because it's digital, it's just not as good. So E.T. and Elliot just start mirroring each other, they touch parts of their face, they bend their finger, and then they share some drowsiness. It's just great visual storytelling to display the basics of E.T.'s empathic link, how it's a two-way street, and how it is safe. John Williams scores all of this with harp strings to characterize this all with innocence, because just imagine with different music, this could feel like alien mind control. It's a really difficult thread to needle, but it totally works, mostly because there is no 
no dialogue to overcomplicate it. The next morning, Elliot fakes being sick by pressing the thermometer against a lamp and putting a heating pad on his head, a trick that Spielberg reportedly used as a kid, and I definitely used as a kid after watching this movie. Elliot shows E.T. his toys, which include some Star Wars Kenner figurines, Greedo, Lando Calrissian, and Boba Fett. According to Spielberg, when he was shooting Close Encounters while George Lucas was shooting Star Wars, Lucas, thinking Close Encounters would be the much bigger movie and that Star Wars would be a flop, traded Spielberg 2.5% of Star Wars for 2.5% of Close Encounters, a deal that made Spielberg a fortune, and a deal that Spielberg, by putting Star Wars toys and costumes in his even bigger movie, E.T., helped grow. Spielberg, of course, also pays homage to his previous work, Jaws. Shark eats the fish. But nobody eats a shark. E.T. tries to eat the toys, so Elliot asks, Are you hungry? I'm hungry. Yes, so it's not just an emotional link, it's also a physiological link. Hunger, pain, fatigue, inebriation. And notice as Elliot leaves to go get food, E.T. worries, and Elliot says, I'll be right here. Which, of course, is what E.T. will say back to him at the end of the movie. I'll be right here. But what is the point of this actual physiological empathic link between E.T. and Elliot? Well, of course, it teaches empathy to a child in this coming-of-age story. Damn it, why don't you grow up, think how other people feel for a change. But within the context of the movie, it suggests that for an advanced species, empathy is a biological imperative that we can evolve toward. If one member of a tribe senses danger, all of us sensing that same physiological danger and joining forces against it will help all of us. There's actually research showing why the sound of a baby crying triggers us. It's an evolutionary distress beacon because humans are social creatures and we don't want to alert predators of our camp. Elliot reveals E.T. to Michael and then to Gertie. Now it gets lost in the screaming, but Gertie clearly made a get well card for her big brother and it's just the sweetest thing. I also just love the realistic little mannerisms that Spielberg was able to get out of these child actors like this one. Um. But my favorite kid to watch in this scene is Michael. He goes in this scene from a jokey older brother to super protective of all of them, including E.T. in this movie. And that transition is just so authentic. Like, I can't tell you how many times I would need my big brother, Matt, to have my back on something. And he would just go from making fun of me to being like, oh no, I got your back. And he would fight the whole goddamn world for me. For Spielberg, this transition was based on how he went from tormenting his sisters to, upon his parents' divorce, protecting them when his father left. Now, there's an interesting little detail here where Gertie calls her mother Mary all the kids in this family call their mom their first name. I think it's just a reaction to the divorce. Like they see her less as a mom than as a big sister, which Spielberg and his mother Leah have gone on the record saying she kind of was to those Spielberg kids. But anyway, they feed E.T. and they show him where on earth they live and a piece of watermelon sticks to his face and Caprice, the mime actress, does this subtle little gesture where she wipes the watermelon off E.T.'s face. It's just a little missable thing that totally makes this character more authentic. And when they ask E.T. where his home is, he points out the window through these rainbow blinds. And at the end of the film, when E.T. leaves, he leaves a rainbow streak in the sky to let them know he's going home. Elliot looks out the window and E.T. places a shaking hand on his shoulder. According to Spielberg, Caprice had been drinking some coffee for this take, making her hand pretty jittery. So at school, Elliot is caught doodling and writing E.T. everywhere. As much as Elliot hates Mike's friends, this really did come from Steve at the bus stop earlier. But he's not a goblin. He's a spaceman. Oh, oh, that's an extraterrestrial. Like the bad guy government men, we do not see the face of Elliot's science teacher either. There's actually a deleted scene in which Harris and Ford would have played the school's principal. And Spielberg thought maybe about putting it back in for the re-releases, but with Ford as such a huge star, it just totally would have changed the film. So like with Jurassic Park, Harrison Ford is so good, he can make a movie better just by not being in it. And to celebrate that, please support the deep dive with an indie I love you shirt at nerdriot.shop. Back at home, E.T. gets drunk and he reads a Buck Rogers comic that reminds him that he needs to be saved and Elliot flooded with an impulse to save, freeze the frogs. Now E.T. watches The Quiet Man, a movie starring John Wayne and Elliot reads reenacts the doorway kiss scene. Now this movie was directed by John Ford, whom Spielberg idolized. As we saw in the Fablemans, it's so oh, Spielberg must have loved paying homage. Back at home, Gertie watches Sesame Street, which E.T. uses to learn English. Good. A phrase that E.T. will tell Gertie at the end of the movie. Be good. E.T. gathers toy parts to try to make a communicator, and Elliot and Michael look around the garage for more stuff. That's true. Remember when he used to take us out to the ball games? 
take us to the movies, we have that popcorn fight. Yeah, just another touching moment where the boys remember their father, specifically the memory of their father taking them to the movies. But remember, Michael just mentioned that E.T. didn't look healthy. So why does E.T. get sick in this movie? One practical possibility is that E.T.'s DNA's six nucleotides instead of the human four nucleotides results in E.T. getting less nourishment from food. It could also be possible that as an extraterrestrial, he's just susceptible to pathogens on Earth, like the aliens in War of the Worlds. But really, notice how this does not begin until E.T. remembers that he has to go home. For E.T., his extreme empathy leaves him with a physiological homesickness. And now Michael and Elliot remembering their father does not help with this, because the longing that E.T. and Elliot filled with each other is now redirected back to their absent parents. Therefore, E.T.'s health at this point will just decline more and more. Elliot cuts his finger on the buzzsaw, and E.T. heals it. And when his finger glows, I love how E.T.'s eyes dilate from the light. This is all happening as Mary reads Peter Pan to Gertie, the whole do you believe in fairies moment. For any kid watching this movie, it's kind of a meta moment because sometimes your most cherished childhood fairy tales can exist beside real magic that exists in the world. While they're trick-or-treating, E.T. sees a kid in a Yoda costume and recognizes him. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, notice how John Williams mixed in the Yoda theme for Empire Strikes Back in there. Dun, 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 dun. And again, since Proto Sogis are Star Wars canon, there is some in universe logic that E.T. might recognize Yoda. E.T. and Elliot ride out in the woods, and E.T. takes control and lifts off. And it is awesome. The fusion of John Williams strings, that iconic moonshot, the moon so large, it's like they're pedaling on the lunar surface. Just at a certain age, we all had this music in our heads whenever we rode our bikes and we felt the wind on our face. Now, I could not ride a bike without training wheels until I was seven years old, which was way too late for my older siblings who all learned earlier and got impatient with trying to teach me since whenever I'd fall, I'd run back inside crying and give up. But one day I just got so sick of being left behind that I just freaking did it. I fell one time, I got back on and I pedaled all the way down to the end of the block where everyone else was. And I will never forget how alive I felt when that happened. So I think this moment in ET doesn't just capture extraterrestrial magic, it captures something simpler, a youth rite of passage that we've all gone through. That moment you first figure out how to ride a bike and you realize you're no longer limited by your neighborhood. And that right there, I think, is why Spielberg, if you notice, kept Elliot pedaling in this shot, even though he doesn't need to, because it's not about E.T. making him fly, it's about a kid breaking free of boundaries. And yes, I think we can all remember that first time we rode a bike, it ends the same way as it does here for Elliot. Don't crash, please. And like Elliot, you always crash at the end. As E.T. rigs up a signal to space, Elliot realizes he doesn't want his friend to leave. I could be happy here. I could take care of you. I wouldn't let anybody hurt you. We could grow up together, E.T. Oof, we can grow up together. Henry Thomas got this part by improvising a scene acting like someone was trying to take his dog away. You can't take him away, he's mine! But it's not my choice. The president asked me to come here and get him. I don't care what the president says, he's my best friend! And then off camera, Spielberg advises the adult in the scenario to cheer up Henry Thomas by saying he can keep the dog, and you can hear Spielberg's voice coming in at the end. And then he'd be your friend forever. And I wouldn't take him away. Okay, kid, you got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Spielberg really, really cared for the child actors on set. He shot the film in chronological order so that tomorrow for the kids would be the next day in the movie's chronology. And that way they could build a truly authentic relationship with E.T. That HBO documentary shows Spielberg really getting animated when directing Henry Thomas in a later scene. No, work yourself up even more. Work yourself up. Does this mean they're coming? Bigger, bigger. Does this mean they're coming? Does this mean they're coming? Yes! and directing Drew Barrymore to cry, followed by him consoling her by having her dry the tears of her doll. Here, wipe the doll's face, too. Thank you. So the next morning, Elliot returns, and Michael finds E.T. sick by the river. It's the most horrifying thing I think I've ever seen in a kid's movie, and I love that they put a real-life raccoon next to that puppet. So government agents take over the house, and we finally see the face of Keys, Peter Coyote, who shares a moment with E.T., and he reveals that he's pretty much a grown-up Elliot. Elliot, he came to me too. I've been wishing for this since I was 10 years old. I think Keyes was just a lifelong believer, but I also like the interpretation that maybe when he was a kid, he saw a UFO or a UAP. During his and Elliot's exchange, I like how Spielberg draws a connection between them by using this trick of a character's face overlaid with a reflective surface showing what they are looking at. E.T. goes into cardiac arrest, and Spielberg used real doctors and nurses from the USC Medical Center so that their medical chatter would be authentic, and we'd really believe that this is a medical emergency where someone died, and E.T. does die, and it's awful. And Keyes lets Elliot have this moment with him. Must be dead, because I don't know 
know how to feel. They can't feel anything anymore. What a profound thing for a kid to have to realize that to lose someone is to struggle to regain how they made you feel when they were alive. Elliot tells E.T. that he loves him and he walks away. And Elliot catches the flowers are coming back to life. E.T. is alive again. His family's coming. And I've always been so impressed with Henry Thomas's ability to pull off both realistic tears and fake tears. No! And those earlier shots we saw of Michael back in the car down the driveway finally now pay off. I've never driven forward before! Meanwhile, Steve and Greg and Ty hop into D&D hero roles like their lives have been waiting for this. And you can actually see Spielberg's camera crew in the reflection of Greg's aviators, but Spielberg smartly justifies it by showing various TV news crews behind Steve. So it just makes sense for people with cameras to be around there. During the chase, Elliot takes out the pegs for that quarantine tube and in a move, smooth as f***ing silk, he tosses the last peg to the scientist. No movie has made suburban biking look as cool as this movie does. The riders pulling off these jumps included BMX stunt doubles Robert Cardoza, Greg Maez, and David Lee, who I want to shout out because for whatever reason they were not listed in this movie's credits. This sequence holds up because it's not some implausible kids one up in the adults hijinks that you see in other movies like Home Alone, but we really could imagine kids outmaneuvering cars in a neighborhood that they spend all their times riding around in and just having good teamwork skills from many nights nice playing D&D. Now, could a 10-year-old like Elliot pedal fast enough with a milk crate and a 30 to 40 pound ET thrown off his balance? I don't know about that, but that's why it helps to make their success so short-lived. We made it! We made it! <laughs> The camera punches in on Elliot, which the Duffer Brothers would also use for their bike chase in Stranger Things. And yes, again, for the 2002 release, Spielberg used VFX to change their shotguns into walkie-talkies, both in this shot and the shot of them fighting the van in the playground. But then later in 2011, he changed it back and he admitted this was a mistake. He said, I never should have done that. E.T. is a product of its era. No film should be revised based on the lenses we now are, either voluntarily or being forced to peer through. He went on to say, all of our movies are a kind of signpost of where we were when we made them and what the world was receiving when we got those stories out there. This gives me so much respect for Steven Spielberg, and I wish George Lucas would have this mindset when it came to the Star Wars movies. But why did Steven Spielberg change them to walkie-talkies in the first place? Was there just something about 2002 America that was super sanitized? Maybe, but I just think Spielberg was afraid to let go. He wanted to preserve E.T. with the kind of innocence that the film was better off not having, because to come of age is to acknowledge that the world has danger in it. But yes, E.T. flies all of them past this roadblock, and they fly past the setting sun instead of the moon. Bringing us to the finale, E.T.'s spaceship returns, and after telling Gertie, be good, E.T. extends his neck upward so that he can be more on eye level with Mike. And E.T.'s goodbye with Elliot is just perfectly edited to John Williams' emotional music. Why? It's because Steven Spielberg was so in awe of Williams' orchestration that rather than have Williams score the music to the sequence, Spielberg reversed it and edited the scene to the music. And I think part of the reason the end of the film has such a kind of operatic sense of completion, real emotional satisfaction as well as satisfaction from what we see, may be partly the result of this wedding of the musical accents with Stephen's film editing. And in addition to this perfect music, just the sentimentality and the simple words exchanged between E.T. and Elliot. Come. Yeah, it kind of feels like E.T. is inviting Elliot to come with him, but Elliot knows that he can't leave. His place is here, and just beside the ship, barely noticeable in the corner. Who's that? That's Elliot's mother, Mary. These two friends acknowledge how much this hurts. Ouch. Ouch. And they hug, and E.T. repeats what Elliot told him earlier to make him feel safe. I'll be right here. E.T. takes the earth plant that he came for, and the ship takes off, forming a rainbow. Our final shot stays with Elliot, and he's okay. Elliot and E.T. needed each other, but just for a time. E.T. needed someone to make him less homesick. Elliot needed someone to replace his dad. But now that Elliot has grown up a bit in his family with Mary and Michael and Gertie, he doesn't need his dad anymore. Now, the film's original ending was going to be Elliot playing D&D with the others and leading it as DM, but we can tell from Elliot's face alone in this shot that the kid's going to be all right. He has finally learned the power of 
letting go of the childish dependencies that held him back. And the reason E.T. will always be a summer movie to me is that nothing is more of a coming of age for a kid of a certain age as when summer comes to an end. The transitional friends that we make at summer camp and we have to say goodbye to. The kids that we ride our bikes around with and then we have to say goodbye to in August because they go to a different school. We never forget those kids, but they aren't meant to be forever friends. They just get us from one point to another and we cherish them for that. And then for some of us, they're deceptively old fugitives who drank all our beer and take off just before the cops get there. I've been sharing a lot of my personal connection to this movie throughout this analysis and I invite you to do that too in the comments below. What was your first experience watching this movie and what do you feel when you watch it again and again as an adult? Subscribe to The Deep Dive. Please turn notifications on. Share this channel and its videos with everyone you know and love, especially people you know and love who love E.T. as much as we do. Follow me at EA Voss and I'll see you next time, my divers of the deep. I'll be right here. That was creepy. Sorry about that.